Okay, well, thank you very much, Zulf. It's a, a pleasure to uh, be able to contribute to, to the day today and actually to meet with uh, Nick Shaw because what Zulf didn't say was, uh, although he and I work closely together, Nick and I have worked together much longer because we were medical students together. So uh, uh, this, uh, the, the links uh, go, go deep. Uh, in some ways, I have an easier job than uh, Zulf, Nick and Ra Raja have looking uh, after children uh, with uh, XLH because by the time I get to see people, the diagnosis is nearly always secure and what I have to do is to carry on with the management but that management does change as people go through our adult life. The picture of the disease changes as we go through adult life and it's something that we've only just really begun to understand over the last 15 to 20 years as uh, Nick has already explained because if you're going to understand the disease you want to know why it happens, what causes it. And for the first part of my clinical career, we recognized this condition, but we didn't really know what was going on. We didn't know who the villain was underlying these deformities, these biochemical abnormalities. And all we could do is to treat what we saw. We couldn't... Uh, actually uh, get at any treatment that might affect what's underlying the condition, which is clearly a much better approach to treatment. But as Nick's already told you, this is the villain. It actually looks like quite a benign sort of thing, unless you've tried untangling a, a ball of wool or something, uh, uh, when you realize that it, it is quite difficult. And that's the structure of the protein. This fibroblast growth factor 23, FGF 23, that we know is the cause of XLH and actually some, some other uh, conditions that uh, cause phosphate problems as well. The main role of FGF 23 appears to be to stimulate the body to lose phosphate in the urine and that's actually important because all animals that live on the land have a problem with phosphate building up. And if you've got people with kidney failure, one of the big metabolic problems is getting rid of phosphate. And so for most people, you need to be getting rid of a little bit of phosphate. The problem is, if you've got too much FGF23, you get rid of too much phosphate. But the other thing about FGF23, and where it becomes much more important in adults is that, as its name implies, it is a growth factor. It stimulates bone growth. And as Nick's already hinted at, we get increased uh, growth of some parts of the skeleton in adults with XLH. And that's what often marks out the difference the sort of problems I see in the patients I treat than the patients that uh, my colleagues in paediatrics uh, treat. So what's so special about phosphate? Well, we actually need a certain amount of phosphate in the uh, uh, body in order for our nerves, our muscles, and various other important bodily functions to work properly. And as Nick's already said, we also need phosphate to combine with calcium to provide the hard mineral tissue that gives our skeletons strength. And as Nick's already said, in adults, the normal levels of phosphate run about 0.8 to 1.3, varies a little bit lab to lab. And as uh, has already been pointed out, in children, particularly at times of uh, growth, uh, so young children, children coming up to puberty, the normal levels of phosphate can be a lot higher than that because you're needing the phosphate to put into the growing skeleton and the body needs more of it. But in XLH, certainly 
the patients I see, if they're off treatment, uh, the levels are significantly lower, that, lower than that. And that has consequences. First of all, the consequence is seen in the skeleton. And the picture in adult bone is a little bit different from uh, in the uh, growing bone, but the basic principle is similar. There's too little mineral in the bone. There's not enough phosphate to join with calcium and produce the calcium phosphate that gives the bone its strength, its stiffness, so the bones get soft. Although they don't bend as much as children's bones, they can continue to bend because they're soft. If a bone bends, it hurts. And uh, so one of the problems we get in uh, adults with XLH is bone pain. And more importantly, the bones can break. So this is the thigh bone here of a patient with uh, uh, X-linked hypophosphatemia, an adult. You can see various, various things. First of all, that bone doesn't look very dense. It's not very white. The sh outer shell of the bone is very thin, and that's because there's not enough mineral there. The bone is bent. That should be much straighter. And you can see there's a crack there. And those cracks are painful. They're known as uh, looser zones or pseudo-fractures, but they can also be the result of stress happening there. And we often see stress fractures occurring in that part of, of the skeleton as well. And so there are at least two reasons why this particular lady might have been having pain in the leg. The bent bone could be painful itself, but also this could be painful, although, although it looks quite impressive, that crack in the bone, they're not always painful. There's actually a third reason why she might be getting pain in the leg, because if you look down at the knee joint here, you can see it's almost bone on bone, and that's osteoarthritis, wear and tear arthritis. And again, because of the change in shape of the bones, that is much more common in people with XLH because the abnormal shape puts stresses on the joints that the joints weren't designed to take. And this can be a progressive uh, uh, effect in the skeleton. So this is uh, a, the bones of a young woman who took over from uh, Professor McGill some years ago now. And you can see when he, he delivered her to me, she had a pretty straight thigh. And you can see compared with the uh, previous x-ray, the bone is much denser, the outer shell of the bone is much thicker. So he's presented her, her to me with uh, uh, remarkably good bones, remarkably straight legs, and you would have thought a success. Unfortunately, you know, Nick was talking about uh, displaying his successes. I'm displaying my failures. Uh, I elected not to treat her because I uh, thought her bones had settled, she'd got no symptoms. And as we know, people don't like taking phosphate. There are potential calcium problems, as Nick explained, with giving the calcitriol or the alpha calcidol. And so uh, I'd left her uh, alone. Uh, and over a period of time, the bones still remained straight. There was good mineral density, but you can see that developing there with pain. So uh, these pseudo-fractures can occur in the adult bone as a result of the bone strength due to the lack of mineral not being there. So the problems I face are due to the bone not having the right strength. So the bone bends, the bone hurts, and the bone might break either incompletely or completely. 
Now, one of the things that Nick was talking about was the effect of this condition on people's growth. By the time it reaches my clinic, XLH can't affect people's growth because they've stopped growing. Uh, so I'm actually concerned not about undergrowth, but I'm concerned about overgrowth. Going back to FGF23, it's a growth factor. It does affect bone growth. And we get new bone growing in various parts of the body, particularly around joints, also where the tendons attach to bone. And this is the condition that Nick referred to as enthesopathy. And we realize that that is something that is a real problem for a lot of adults with XLH, often for them a bigger problem than the bones themselves. So to illustrate that, this is a lady who I've seen for a long time in uh, clinic now. And this is uh, her pelvis. And again, you can see she has got some bone problems. So you know, she, she's got good good amount of mineral there, but you can see a little crack there. So she's got a pseudo fracture. But that isn't what's causing her problems. What's causing her problems are uh, these extra bits of bone growing there, where the big muscles, the gluteal muscles, join into the bone uh, there, which uh, is uh, important for the uh, movement of the leg. And there, around the hip joint, and you can see it's around, and it's actually under, you can see behind there. So these have caused her painful restriction of movement of her joints. So in addition to her bone pain, she's also not able to move as much as she once could. And quite often, particularly around the hips, this becomes incredibly limiting in the sort of things uh, that uh, people are able to do. And at the moment, none of the treatments uh, we've got are focusing on this. We might hope that some of the newer treatments that uh, Raj is going to describe this afternoon, uh, if they're given early enough, might stop uh, this sort of thing happening. But for me, it's this new bone growth that's the real challenge of how I manage uh, the symptoms in my, my patients uh, with XLH. Bad enough is the new bone growth around the hips. But the one that really concerns me is when they get new bone growth in the spine. This is a lady that uh, we had in our clinic uh, some time ago. Thankfully, this is not such a common condition that we're seeing it every uh, week or month. But those who come to my clinic, you must think, why am I asking? Uh, how are your bladder? How are your bowels? What are your legs like? It's because if we get this new bone growing in the spine, and there's the vertebral body, uh, there are some ribs coming off, and this dense white stuff is new bone that's growing within the canal that the nerves go down. And that can cause pressure on the nerves, either in the canal itself or as they come out of the canal. And that can cause weakness, it can cause uh, loss of sensation, and it can affect the function of the bladder and the bowels. And if that happens, it is possible for a surgeon to come and chip that bone away, but uh, I think uh, Tahir would say it, that's not an easy thing to do. And uh, ideally, we're looking for a treatment that's going to stop that happening rather than uh, uh, asking uh, to hear and his colleagues to uh, take it away afterwards. So for me, dealing with adults with uh, XLH, I have problems with the bones and the bone weakness, and I have problems with bone growing where I don't want it. But there are other problems as well. So 
Kay's going to talk a little bit later about uh, dental problems. I don't want to steal her thunder, but I actually think by the time I get the patients, it's much less of a problem than uh, in uh, paediatric uh, practice, although I'm still having to refer uh, patients on for specialist dental treatment. The other thing that we do see in a small group of patients with uh, XLH, uh, and I think it's more common in adults than uh, in, in children, is the bone abnormality can affect the middle ear, can produce problems with hearing, problems with balance. Clinically, it's very like Meniere's disease, but it, it actually has the same uh, uh, cause because of the uh, uh, bone around the middle ear being affected. So those are the clinical problems I deal with. What tools do I have in my kit to deal with them? And I think, first of all, you've got to remember that uh, we don't necessarily rush straight in with powerful medication. You've got to think about simple things. Very simple things like orthotic insoles Maybe all that someone needs to correct the pain from uh, the arthritis associated with a deformed leg. If someone has some hearing impairment, a hearing aid may do them a shed load more good than any medicine I, I can give them. And it's very easy to think about rushing in with medical treatment or surgical treatment when people actually need something simple. Equally, it is important to remember the simple things you can do. Pain relief is often all that someone might need. But remember general bone health. Just because someone has got a bone disease uh, that we can put a label on doesn't mean that we shouldn't be encouraging people to do things that maintain their skeletal health. So as much as their condition allows, maintain activity. Eat a healthy, balanced diet. You know, there's, no, uh, uh, there's no point in uh, uh, suggesting that any diet's going to cure this, but actually uh, eating sensibly is important, particularly if, as some of my patients with XLH have got limitation on their movement, if they gain weight, that's going to make things worse. So you've got to actually look at a person in the round and deal with all that. And as Nick's already said, vitamin D is important. We know that in this part of the world, if you look at vitamin D levels in the community as a whole, let alone the more at-risk groups like people from South Asian background, uh, we get very low vitamin D levels anyway. And that's bad for bones anyway, so uh, we should be making sure that all our patients with XLH or indeed any other bone disease have the general bone health dealt with. We then move on to treating the underlying condition. For many years, what we've actually said is, well, this is a condition that's caused by low levels of phosphate in the blood. So we know it's leaking at the kidney, but we can put it up by putting more phosphate in at the top end. Now, it's not ideal. It's uh, like trying to uh, uh, have a uh, bath in a bathtub where you've not got a plug in the plug hole, so you've turned the taps on as fast as possible to try and get enough water in the bath to uh, allow yourself to have a wash. Uh, and it's even harder because many of you will hate me for trying to persuade you to take Sandoz phosphate. It doesn't taste nice. It gives you diarrhea, it gives you stomach cramps, some people feel sick with it, but it's the only phosphate supplement we can easily get in, in this country. Nick talked about some of the uh, other, other ones uh, 
that are potentially available, we found it very difficult to obtain those for other people. And actually, giving people lots of phosphate isn't totally ideal anyway, because it does two things. Firstly, as Nick hinted, it increases the uh, parathyroid hormone. And that can put the calcium levels up in the blood. It can overstimulate the parathyroid gland. And when that happens, that can cause bone pain from its own right. So there are some patients who I've seen in my clinic who we've had to refer to have an abnormal parathyroid gland taken out. And there are a small group of patients who I treat with a drug called sinocalcid to damp down the activity of the uh, parathyroid gland to try and prevent it causing bone pain. But, and more importantly, we know that if you deliver a load of phosphate to the body, the bone cells say, ooh, there's a lot of phosphate around, more than I was expecting. I need to make more FGF23 to get rid of that. So actually, by treating people with phosphate supplements, if you're not careful, particularly if you give it in big doses intermittently rather than small doses spread out, you can push up the level of FGF23, the very thing that's causing this uh, condition. And that might make this new bone growth worse. We don't know that, but it is something that uh, is uh, a major concern to those of us treating adults with XLH. So the other tool we have in the toolkit is using these active vitamin D metabolites, these drugs alpha calcidol or calcitriol. I think most people in the UK do use alpha calcidol. I actually quite like using calcitriol because uh, it, it seems to work a bit better in my hands, but that's uh, a, a bit of personal preference and I don't think there's any real difference between them. And they have two roles in the management of people with XLH. First, first place, they actually do help the body absorb phosphate, so uh, it does help deal with the underlying uh, condition. But most importantly, it stops the rise in parathyroid hormone that occurs when you give phosphate. So it allows you to give more phosphate into the system to try and correct the bones uh, without the side effect of the overactive parathyroids. But the problem is the main role of these two particular drugs is to increase the absorption of calcium. And if you get too much calcium absorbed, you're excreted at the kidney, you can get kidney stones, you can get calcification in the kidneys, and uh, ultimately uh, you can end up with impaired kidney function. And so one of the things that uh, we have to be very careful about is examining people's kidneys. We don't need to do it quite as often as the pediatricians do, so I, as those of you who come to my clinic know, don't scan every year or every two years, probably scan every five years, but I try and look at the amount of calcium you're putting out in the urine at least once a year, because it is important that we don't uh, end up damaging people's kidneys uh, from the treatment that we're trying to give them. Quite a lot of my patients end up being referred for, uh, for surgery, and I don't want to tread too much onto to his toes, but obviously that has very specific aims. So if someone's broken a bone, it needs fixing. If someone's got deformity, it's possible to fix that. <coughs> a lot of these people with arthritis will come to uh, joint uh, replacement. And finally, as we've seen, if you've got bone where it shouldn't be, particularly in the spine, that can be removed. And then looking 
not at the orthopedic surgeon, but at the endocrine surgeon, if you've got an overactive parathyroid gland, that may uh, need uh, plucking out. So there's a kind of overview of the problems we've got in managing XLH in adults. The rather limited toolkit we've got. And the question is, well, what about the future? And obviously, what we really want to do is to control that villain that we started with. And we now are beginning to see treatments that are targeted at FGF23. And the hope would be that if those treatments come to fruition in the way that we expect and hope, that might actually revolutionize the way that we're able to treat this condition. It might very much minimize the risk that uh, people have of going on and uh, forming new bone. It might really improve the prospects for treatment in childhood and minimizing the deformity. And in the minute, I'm getting patients handed over to me from the pediatric college with pretty straight legs, with uh, pretty normal height, but uh, there is the prospect that they will come to my successors with absolutely normal stature, absolutely uh, normal shape, and that's clearly something that we would all want to see. So I'll finish there. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm not going to be able to be around for the panel in the afternoon. So if you do want to ask me questions, ask now or grab me in the coffee break, and uh, I'm happy to, uh, to deal, with, deal with those. So uh, the, the question is basically, someone with XLH has got vertigo, uh, and that's the... Uh, uh, the Meniere's type uh, condition that I, I was uh, uh, talking about. Um, so there is certainly a link, and it would certainly be worthwhile getting, uh, getting your partner referred to an ENT surgeon to try and... She was seeing a specialist down in London, the yeah. neurology hospital, who diagnosed mi migranal ver vertigo. Okay, so it might be different. I mean, obviously, it's... It's difficult without knowing the patient to be absolutely uh, sh sure about this, but we do know that there are some patients with XLH get something that looks very much like Meniere's disease, and it would be worth having that tested. But of course, just because you've got XLH doesn't mean you're immune to any of the other causes of vertigo. We're from Durham. Do you take referrals? <laughs> uh, poten potentially, we take referral referrals he uh, here, but the, you know there are the, there's a bone clinic up in Newcastle, uh, and uh, the, that's a little bit nearer. For you. <laughs> I think we must uh, thank Peter as well for his excellent talk. Yeah. Well. Okay, can we have more questions, please? You wait Oliver, mm -hmm. hi. Um, Obviously, cal the calcification. <laughs> Sorry, I think it's gone. Oh, so the calcification around the spine and the hips is in adulthood is obviously a, a real monster. And from a patient perspective, it's really hard to comprehend and understand why our body is distributing these rock-hard pieces of calcium around <laughs> these areas when my body can also it really struggles to heal fractures mm -hmm. at, at the same time. And, and, and that, that's quite challenging to understand, I think. Could you, would, you be able to, would you explain how that occurs? Uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think I can explain adequately, but it's clearly it's a difference between the response in normal bone. And at these sites, there is where you're getting the new bone formation, it's where there is a degree of stress on, on the skeleton, either where, you know, the, around a joint or where the ligament or tendon goes into bone. And so it's something where you've got a, a stress response 
that seems to go wrong and uh, you get this abnormal bone formation and that bone it's not you know your ordinary bones ordinary bones are often quite weak quite soft whereas this new bone that gets formed is rock hard you know the particularly the bone that gets formed in the spine the uh, last time i referred someone to have that operated on the spinal surgeon uh, uh, was calling me every name under the sun because it, it took him ages to uh, get rid of that bone just because it was so absolutely hard. It was like marble, he said. So it, it, it is something very abnormal about that bone that's being laid down. Uh, and we don't really know why that has happened. I mean, I don't know if you have any. I was going to ask a question really just related to the hospital of the of treatment. Oh, we're not giving them any anti-resorptive treatment. So, no, 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 no. So, I mean, the question there was, uh, Tahir was wondering whether some of the treatments we're giving might lead to build up a bone, but uh, uh, I wouldn't normally be giving people uh, the sort of treatments we give, say, to someone with osteoporosis that might block bone breakdown. So we're not doing that. No. There's a question there. That they actually, uh, through losing phosphate, absorb too much calcium and it okay. deposits in the kidneys and it causes nephrocalcinosis and kidney yeah. stones. So it doesn't affect the bones in terms of rickets or vitamin mm -hmm. D. So when you mentioned about the parathyroid hormone mm -hmm. um, and you gave the medication to balance out the mm -hmm. effects of the phosphate, um, they just have the phosphate, but they do, because they don't have the vitamin D deficiency or rickets, they don't receive the other medication. So what I would like to know is, um, is their parathyroid hormone potentially at, at risk of you know presenting symptoms because of that? I think the picture is very different between children and adults. Uh, as I said, you know, the phosphate level in children is much higher. The alkaline phosphatase level is much higher in children, just because children are having to grow a skeleton so they're having to put a lot of uh, phosphate uh, and calcium into that skeleton as they grow and therefore a lot of the considerations that I have as a doctor treating adults are very different uh, from uh, Zulf and uh, colleagues who treat, treat children and so I don't think the same considerations apply the, there, although it may be as they go through the teenage years and move into adulthood and the skeleton matures and stops growing, you need to start to think about those sort of issues then. But the, the aim of a management in childhood is to make sure that people have as normal a skeleton at maturity as possible, and that requires a different sort of mindset to the mindset that I need treating after that. Well, my, my daughter's here. She's 20, so she's yeah. actually one of yeah. your patients. Think, but yeah. as far as I'm aware, she's not actually been checked for yeah. her parathyroid hormone. she's in hormone. my clinic, she'll have had she'll her parathyroid <laughs> hormone checked. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different mutation. It's an SEL34 yeah. mutation. Yeah. So the primary yeah. problem is uh, it's not an FGF. In fact, the FGF23 is low in that mm. condition. Mm and uh, there's a primary loss of phosphate mm. in the kidneys. Yeah. Mm. And in fact, 125 levels, which we discussed earlier, yeah. which Professor Shaw mentioned, mm. are high, and that causes um, uh, increased absorption of calcium. Yeah. Yeah. So in mm. fact, um, the mutation or the spelling mistake that occurs among white Caucasians seems to cause kidney stones and, mm. and, and uh, uh, calcium to be passed in the urine. Mm. Whereas the same mutation we, when we see, when during my visits in the Middle East, we see um, severe rickets, in yeah. fact, you know. So in fact, the first mutation, the same condition was described in Bedouin Arabs by mm. the Israelis. And, uh, uh, the, the key thing is that, you know, if you treat them like what you heard now, you will actually make their kidneys worse. Oh, you will yeah. calcify yeah. their yeah. kidneys. Yeah. So, uh, again, it's a, a, it's a predominantly an XLH meeting, but as I mentioned, there are other spelling mistakes which yeah. produce uh, phosphate loss, uh, but uh, require different treatment. Yeah. And, of course, you know, one of the things we see in 
a lot of adults. And again, we don't really understand why it differs from XLH. We, quite a lot of, I say a lot of adults, uh, probably one or two a year in, a, uh, in the whole of the Northwest. Uh, some adults develop tumors that make FGF23. And uh, interestingly, although they get very severe uh, phosphate loss, they get weak bones, uh, they get pain from the bones, they actually don't develop the enthesopathy that the XLH people do. So going back to Oliver's point, it's, it's something we don't understand yet. Uh, presumably, as we do more work, we'll understand a bit more about it. But uh, So it is uh, a lot of areas we don't understand, but I think, it, as Nick was saying, it is sometimes in, uh, important to remember that although people can look quite similar in terms of the condition externally, and perhaps even quite similar with regards to some of the biochemistry, it's not actually as straightforward as that. And, some, uh, uh, and sometimes you've got to differentiate these different causes to make sure you've got the treatment targeted for that particular patient. Other questions? That's it. There's one there. <laughs> Should have put a flat on. Not There's one there and then the second question at the end, please, thanks. I, I was just uh, wondering whether the low phosphate in the blood leads, does that affect the andesine triphosphate uh, production or breakdown at all? I think the main amount of phosphate in the body is actually in the cells. Uh, so it's very different from, say, calcium, where, uh, well, obviously in the body, the main amount of, uh, of calcium is in the skeleton. But apart from that, there's more calcium in the blood than there is in the cells. Whereas with phosphate, there's more phosphate in the cells than, than the blood. And so there's usually in people with metabolic disorders that have got a low phosphate, there's usually enough phosphate still in the cells to allow those metabolic processes to, to continue. But we do know some people with low phosphate uh, do get muscle weakness, and that might be just because those metabolic effects are beginning to be impinged on. Right. There was a question at the back. Oh, my God. <laughs> We'll keep you fit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's what I was saying about needing to exercise to keep your bones fit. Thank <laughs> you. Um, sorry, I missed part of your presentation, unfortunately, because our children were being a little bit naughty. Um, I just wondered, my, obviously, I've got the condition from my father, um, and I just wondered, again, I might have missed it. I uh, do apologise if I did. Um, he gets a lot of abscesses on his back for some reason. So, like... I suppose they're like, mm, like boils type thing. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know why that is. They just, again, randomly appear, a bit like dental abscesses. And as a child, I used to get a lot of ear infections. So we just wonder whether there's any kind of, um, anything you might have seen maybe uh, in terms of patients where other things might have happened on the body um, that might be linked to that maybe. I, I mean, it's a good question and it, it certainly bears thinking about as to w whether... Uh, because people can get, get dental abscesses, whether abscesses elsewhere. Now, I've always thought the dental abscesses were related to uh, uh, the actual bone, dis bone disease itself. And I, I must admit, I've not seen people with recurrent soft tissue uh, abscesses. I mean, I don't, no, mm -hmm. colleagues haven't either. So I think it's bad luck rather than any connection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So late. Sorry. When you say you do that operation to remove the extra bone, sorry, does that does that then do you have to do it again? Do the, does the bone come back or is that Potent potentially? And uh, I mean, one of the hopes we have of the FJ twenty three based treatments is that that might s stop that happening. I mean, I've never actually had a patient who's required 
two spi spinal operations, but you would get very worried that uh, the same thing uh, might, might come back. Uh, you know, as I say, it's not very common, but it, it's the one complication I really worry about because if you don't pick it up early enough, the consequences for an individual could be devastating. So, uh, you know, those of you who've got the uh, got XLH, if you do notice any problem with your bladder or, or bowels, or notice <coughs> that you're developing weakness, uh, uh, particularly in your legs or loss of sensation, don't sit on it. Ask someone about it uh, because if it's picked up early it's uh, much easier to deal with than if it's gone on to do long-term nerve damage. What, what do you actually mean when you say bladder issues? Like well, normally it would be uh, if people lost uh, control of their bladder, control of their bowels, lost sensation of their bladder, uh, sensation of their bowels, not just if someone's having a little bit of cystitis or something, right. something like that. And what is the adult age, sorry? excuse my ignorance, but what, what, when do they actually switch over from child to...? The, there's increasingly, we've been talking about, it's, it's not a switch, it's a transition. So I do a clinic uh, with, with Zolf and Raja, and I'm sure uh, uh, Nick would do a, a similar one in, in Birmingham, where we, we plan and we uh, you know, explain that, uh, the, and it differs from from individual to individual when when the right right point point is but it's somewhere between 16 and 18 right. usually that the the shift will be made but increasingly we're doing that in a much more gradual measured approach rather than somewhat as used to happen uh, someone said you're too old for me now I'll write to my colleague in the adult hospital and you'll get an appointment from them we we, we try and see the patients together, uh, intru introduce ourselves from the adult side, uh, uh, explain that actually my adult clinic is nothing like as nice as the new children's <laughs> hospital that these guys have their clinic in. <laughs> Um, Thank but you. I think the point is that spinal stenosis is not a pediatric no. condition, no. and uh, it, it's also very rare, as you yeah. mentioned. It's yeah. not, not, not a common problem. No. no. I mean, the last referral I made for that was over 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, whilst you're here, Peter, can I just ask you a few questions? The, the, do you treat every patient like we do um, with, with phosphate and, um, and uh, either calcitrol or alpha calcitrol, or do you stop treatment in some? For some, I stop treatment because we're, uh, we're, we're not dealing with a developing skeleton. There are some adults who are totally asymptomatic, really given our concerns about pushing up FGF23 yeah. with phosphate. Uh, I've tended to take people who've not got symptoms and we have a bit of a discussion uh, that uh, as to whether we we treat or not most people are very happy no longer to have to take the phosphate I have to admit but uh, uh, I think in the light of those x-rays I showed of uh, progressive changes in bones you've got to be careful that uh, you're not uh, doing a disservice by a by stopping, but you've got a bit of a, a trade-off. Uh. And, and the other complications that you mentioned, uh, well, in fact, Nick talk, uh, talked about is the skull base problems mm. leading to Kihari malformations, causing headaches, mm. other things. Do you think we should be actively screening for some of these um, uh, complications in our patients? Uh, we as pediatricians don't seem to do, but in another bone condition, uh, brittle bone disease, yeah. we are um, probably more aware of uh, screening for skull-based problems? I don't come across a, 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 a lot of that. And of course, what, by the time people have transitioned into my clinic, anything will have been uh, set in stone, if you, if you like. And so from my point of view, I'm not sure you're going to gain very much from that screening because I don't get people who are symptomatic from it. Okay. I think if, if people are symptomatic, it'll show. Now, obviously, if someone's got uh, 
craniosynostosis, the abnormal fusion of the skull, you'll pick that up anyway. So I think the skull-based ones probably question, will present if they need yeah. to. Um, I was diagnosed with anal chiari malformation back in 2015, mm -hmm. um, but I've had symptoms from about 2002 which haven't been picked up. So in my case, I'm all for the screening. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I'd like my daughter, who's got XLH, to have screening for chiari malformation as early as possible because it's left me with quite, um, quite severe circumstances because it was caught late. I, I mean, I guess that's... <coughs> the issue, isn't it, that you had had symptoms that weren't, weren't picked up. And if we're not going to screen people, we've got to be very aware of symptoms. You know, I'd, I'd entirely accept that. And I think on the once bitten, twice shy basis, I presume that people will be actually very uh, uh, amenable to the idea of screening any of your children for that, uh, having seen what it's done, done to you. Uh. OK, <clears throat> as uh, Professor Selby unfortunately won't be staying behind, so now is your opportunity to ask questions. Um, there are no, we've got an adult surgeon here, adult and pediatric surgeon, but we won't have an adult doctor to answer questions this afternoon. I think that's a bit cruel to, uh, to hear. <laughs> sorry, He's still a doctor. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I, I meant, you know what I meant. At least he's out of the room. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm sure he'll forgive me. <laughs> okay. If not, then, Peter, thank you very much thank for you. coming on Saturday morning. <laughs>